Science. It's the pursuit of knowledge, the quest for understanding. But what if I told you there's a way to make scientific research even more robust and transparent? Enter registered reports. Registered reports are a new way of conducting research that was formally introduced to science 10 years ago by Chris Chambers, although others had talked about the format and dabbled in it before that. Before I explain what a registered report is, let's understand the traditional research process. Typically, researchers conduct a study, analyze the results, and then submit their findings to a journal after they've learned about the results. The editor and the reviewers of that scientific report through the process known as peer review evaluate the study, its logic, and whether the results are valid. The editor then uses the reviewer's evaluations to accept the paper as is, ask for a revision that addresses the reviewer's comments, or rejects the paper altogether. But many perfectly valid studies will, in fact, never see the light of day. Do you know why? In a previous video, I talked about the incentives that drive so much academic publishing these days. Getting hired, being promoted, receiving grant funding, all depend on successfully getting your research published in a respected scientific journal. And in that video, I pointed out that those incentives can drive poor quality research and even fraud in some cases. But imagine that you decide you will do all this the right way. You conduct your research and analyze the results, but you have nothing conclusive or fantastic to report in the end. Well, remember that those for-profit journals also have incentives, and they want to be able to charge a lot of money for subscriptions, and they can do that if their journal is highly regarded, and therefore the source of citations for other research papers. If you have a relatively boring set of findings, then many journals will not be interested in what you actually found. This is known as publication bias, the tendency of journals to favor publishing studies with positive or significant results over those with null or negative results. This bias can distort the scientific literature by underrepresenting studies that don't find an effect or fail to replicate a previous study. This is where registered reports come in. With registered reports, researchers submit their research questions and methods to a journal before they start their study. The journal reviews these, and if they approve, they commit to publishing the results regardless of the outcome. It's all about the quality of the question and the rigor of the method, not just the wow factor of the results. So how do these things work? Well, first we have pre-study submission. During manuscript preparation, researchers draft an introduction, share the study's rationale, and detail their planned methodology, everything from data collection to analysis. This is done before any actual data collection. The prepared manuscript is then submitted to a journal, and this is called the initial submission. At this point, the editor could decide not to have the paper reviewed at all. That is, they might decide that the paper doesn't really fit with the journal's mission, or there's something wrong about the whole approach of the study, and so they can send it back to the authors without any further uh, work being done on it. Let's assume that the editor does decide that this is a paper worthy of review. So then you would go into stage one of peer review. The manuscript faces its first big test, the stage one of peer review. At this stage, reviewers look at the importance of the research and the robustness of the methods. And since the research hasn't been done, results aren't even in the picture. Now the reviewers could decide or recommend that the paper should be rejected. But then again, the reviewers' feedback might lead to revisions in the proposal. And this would help the researchers then refine their approach. With all ducks in a row, the manuscript could then eventually get the golden ticket, In Principle Acceptance, or IPA. The journal is promising to publish the study, provided that the researchers stick to the plan and consider the feedback. The actual results? Well, they don't influence this decision. Then it's on to step three, conducting the research. Now it's showtime. The data collection phase begins. Researchers hustle, sticking to their blueprint. Embracing transparency, many opt for open science practices. Pre-registering their studies, sharing their data, and using open source tools are all par for the course. Then we have step four, the post-study submission. With the study wrapped, it's time for stage two manuscript preparation. This incorporates results, discussions, and any necessary updates. This enriched manuscript, along with its results, finds its way back to the journal. And then in step five, we have the final review. The review of adherence ensures that the researchers walk the talk following the approved methods and previously given feedback. Some more revisions might be in order, but once it's all set, voila, the study is published for the world to see. Then step six, post-publication. 
And in the spirit of open science, many researchers go one step further. Data sharing means that raw data, analysis scripts, and other materials are made available for others to dive deeper, to reproduce, or even extend the research. So how does this improve the scientific process, you might ask? Well, the primary issues addressed by registered reports include, first of all, publication bias. It eliminates the problem of publication bias because the decision about whether or not the paper will be accepted for publication is made before the results are known. And then there's also the fact that it reduces p-hacking. This is when researchers consciously or unconsciously manipulate their data or analyses until they find a significant result. This can be done by excluding certain data points, trying out multiple statistical tests, and splitting and combining the data in various ways until a significant finding emerges. And then there's the third one, which is that it helps reduce the problem of low statistical power. Many studies, especially in fields like psychology, have been criticized for having too few participants to reliably detect the effects that they're studying. Registered reports aim to address these three issues by changing the publication process. By getting peer review before the results are known, the focus shifts from the results themselves to the quality of the research question and the rigor of the methodology and the sample size. Let's look at some examples. Do you remember the famous marshmallow test? This is the study that claimed that kids who could resist eating a marshmallow for 15 minutes had better life outcomes. But later studies have found mixed results. If the initial study had been a registered report, the methods would have been scrutinized and standardized from the start, potentially leading to clearer conclusions. And another example, imagine someone comes up with a new way to make fertilizer for houseplants using old tea bags. They could propose a study to test the effectiveness of the fertilizer at different doses and intervals. In stage one of the review process, the reviewers might ask for clarification on the type of tea bags to use and if it works for different houseplants. The researcher could then modify the plan to include fertilizers made from either black or green tea bags and test them on three different types of houseplants. Once the study gets its IPA, the researcher would conduct the study as planned. They may find that the type of tea used doesn't matter and that the treatment works best for houseplants that need a lot of sunshine. Regardless, the paper would still be published and the researcher could discuss those unexpected results. Do you think registered reports sound like a great idea? A major innovation in the world of science? Well, registered reports have been gaining popularity since their introduction in 2013 in the journal Cortex. As of now, over 300 journals from various fields have adopted the registered reports format. The Center for Open Science maintains a comprehensive list of journals that offer registered reports, including a wide range of disciplines such as psychology, nutrition, plant science, neuroscience, genetics, cancer research, biology, and economics. These journals have added sections to their traditional format journals that are dedicated to registered reports. Except for Comprehensive Results in Social Psychology, which is the only journal to exclusively publish registered reports since its launch in 2014. In 2020, the Royal Society Open Science and 11 other journals launched the COVID-19 Registered Reports Rapid Review Network. This initiative aimed to review stage one registered reports related to COVID-19 within seven days and then publish them as open access without any article processing charges. Registered reports are a game changer. They make me confident in my approach and ensure that good science gets the spotlight it deserves. But there are some obstacles and myths that have led some people in journals not to try them. One is hampering exploratory research. A major critique of registered reports is that they stifle exploratory research. But here's the reality. Although these reports emphasize planning, they do accommodate for explorations. Most published registered reports, in fact, include post hoc analyses at stage two. And then two is the risk of being scooped. You might wonder, isn't there a risk of someone else publishing your idea while you're still in the review process? Well, according to Chambers and Savella, since 2013, not a single incident of scooping has been linked to registered reports. The process is rigorous and protects your intellectual property. And then third, a fixed inflexible plan. It's a myth that you're trapped in a rigid plan with registered reports. If circumstances demand change, the journal editor and the reviewers can be consulted. The key is to be transparent when reporting any adjustments at stage two. Four, presenting data fraudulently. There are concerns that authors might pretend they haven't yet collected data when submitting registered reports. 
but authors must certify the stage of their data collection and analysis. Fraud? Yeah, that's a risk, but it's a risk in any research domain, and reviewers are trained to spot inconsistencies. Five, slowing down young researchers. Many believe that registered reports are slow and tedious, particularly for early career researchers. But think of this, many traditional papers undergo multiple reviews across different journals. Registered reports, in many cases, can expedite the discovery process. And six, there are ethical complications. Ethics, of course, are paramount. When research needs to change after stage one, there can be complications, especially if the journal seeks confirmation from the researcher's ethics committee. But we must always prioritize ethical considerations, even if it means adjusting our approach. What's the future of registered reports? Obviously, one major goal is to increase the use of this method and format among all scientists. Change is hard, but those supporting registered reports like Chris Chambers have argued for three major initiatives in the short term. First, give extra incentives or weightings for people publishing registered reports when they're going up for job hires or promotions. Two, Grant agencies could ask for proposals that are basically registered reports, and some granting agencies have already started to do this. And third, have all clinical trials done this way. Even though trial registration is now the norm, registration does not guarantee that trials are pre-registered rather than post-registered, that trial results will be reported free from bias, or that the results will be published at all. In a world where facts matter more than ever, Registered reports are paving the way for a more transparent, rigorous, and unbiased scientific future. So what do you think about registered reports? Do you believe they could be the future of scientific publishing? I'd love to hear your thoughts and experiences, so drop a comment below and let's kickstart a conversation about making science more transparent and robust. I've also included some references about all of this in the description below if you'd like to read more about it. And if you believe in a more transparent scientific world, share this video with friends, colleagues, and fellow science enthusiasts. The more we spread the word, the closer we get to a change. Together, we can champion a future where science is open and unbiased. Remember to like, share, and subscribe for more discussions on the evolving world of science and psychology. Thanks for watching.